Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. Today, I'm joined by Hubert Jolie, the former chairman and chief executive officer of Best Buy, who served in that role from 2012 to 2019 and continued to serve as executive chairman of the company through June of 2020. He's also the author of the new book, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. Uber has received recognition as one of the top performing CEOs in the world from numerous business periodicals. He was previously the chief executive officer of Carlson Companies, is currently a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, and serves on the boards of Johnson & Johnson, Ralph Lauren, and a variety of other organizations. In this interview, we discuss Uber's personal philosophy of the purpose of business and why he viewed Best Buy as being more than just a consumer electronics retailer. He also shares insights from his book, such as how he identified weaknesses in Best Buy's strategy and transformed the company to focus on collaboration with suppliers, alignment of interests of all stakeholders, and what he calls human magic. If you enjoy Technovation, please consider reading my new book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book is now available on Amazon. As a special offer to our CXO listeners, if you purchase 50 or more books for your team, I'd be happy to join your team for a group discussion on it. To learn more, write us at information at metastrategy.com or visit gettingtonimble.com. Thank you. Hubert Jolie, welcome to Technovation. It's great to see you today. Well, thank you, Peter, for having me. Well, let me just uh, provide a few minutes, uh, a few moments rather, of introduction for those who I, I, you don't require a lot of introduction, but uh, uh, Polytest alone requires it from my perspective. So, Hubert Jolie is the former chairman and chief executive officer of Best Buy, a role that you had from 2012 to 2019. Uh, he's also the author of uh, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles of the Next Era of Capitalism. Uh, Uber, I must say, uh, a, a terrific read and congratulations on that accomplishment as well. Thank you. I give it uh, everything I had, I hope that uh, it really can serve as a guide for uh, leaders who are eager to abandon the old ways and, you know, leads in a, try to create a future that does not exist yet, but uh, that needs to be better than what we have today. And I think there's some some principles that we can talk about from that, but uh, I hope it's a helpful book. Indeed it is. And I'm looking forward to, to, to getting into some of those very principles. And I thought, Uber, that we would begin our conversation where you begin your book, which is uh, with a very interesting sort of philosophical set of points that you raise about the meaning of work in one's life. Um, you talk about the way in which it's framed, for example, through regulation in your native France. Uh, you even sought the wisdom of the Bible and uh, what, what's, uh, what's documented there in terms of uh, one's understanding and, and connection to work. And I wonder if you could just share a little bit about the your own personal philosophy and what you've drawn from some of your both your experiences, but also your um, your research into work uh, through a variety of different contexts. Yeah, thank you, Peter. It's, I think it's good to start with the fundamentals because, as the you know, what's the definition of madness? Right, it's doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. There is no denying that the world today is facing a multifaceted crisis, whether it's health, economic you know, societal, racial, environmental, geopolitical, you name it. So I think we have to define how we want to move forward. What's the way ahead? And starting with why do we work as individual, I think is a good starting place. And of course, you know, work is a mixed reputation. For some of us, you know, work is hard. It's a curse. It's a punishment because some dudes, you know, sinned in paradise. We've also had the view, uh, you know, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, that work is something you do so that you can do something else that's more fun, like uh, going to see a Vikings game if you're in Minneapolis, right? Defeating the, the, the Green Bay Packers. How fun is that? Um, there's a different view, which is that work is part of our fulfillment as human beings. It's our opportunity to do something good in the world. And I love this quote from Khalil Gibran, uh, the Le Lebanese poet, who says that work is love made visible. And so I like to start from that. Now you could say, Peter, what does it have to do with anything and with companies and so forth? Well, I think that something magical happens in business if you can connect what drives you with what the company is about. And there's a pandemic of disengagement at work because many, many of us just can't do this. So one of the things we did at Best Buy, and that's maybe a, a very practical advice for us as leaders, of course, you have to be clear about what drives you, what you know, what, what's your purpose in life, how you want to be remembered. You know, write down your retirement speech. Think about what you want to hear. You're not going to be there, but what you'd like people to say during your eulogy. Right? Think about this. And ask people around you, people on your team, what drives you? I had a store general manager at Best Buy in Boston, 
he would ask every one of the associates in this store, about 100 of them, what is your dream at Best Buy or outside of Best Buy? Write it down in the break room. My goal, my role as the uh, general manager of the store is to help you achieve your dream. It changes everything if you can make that connection. Because at the end of the day, what is a company? What is a business? And I don't care whether it's a retailer, a service company, a tech company, it's all the same. It's a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And my view is that, you know, it, contrary to what Milton Friedman wanted us to, to, to think about shareholder primacy, it's not about making money. Making money is an outcome. It's not the ultimate goal. You know, when you retire again, will you be so proud when you're about to die? I made a million by the age of 30. Who cares, you know? Uh, that's not the essence. Of course, we need to make money. It's an imperative, but that's not the ultimate goal. So I start with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to begin. And it really filters through the way in which you thought about your approach, uh, among other places, very specifically at Best Buy. I, I wanted to take take you back to the beginning of your time there. Another anecdote that you share early in your your book is visiting some of the Best Buy locations in the Twin Cities, where you were already based, uh, before taking the role of chairman and chief executive officer. Talk a bit about what you found and some of those initial impressions of where the company was, and of course, uh, by extension, uh, some a uh, short time thereafter, the company that you would inherit as leader. Yeah, so we, let's all rewind to uh, the spring of 2012. At that time, if you remember, everybody thought we were going to die, to the point where you know, when I, get, when I got the call from the headhunter to consider this job, I said, Jim, you're crazy, right? It's a mess. I'm not a retailer and it's a mess. Uh, you know, it's going to, you know, everybody thinks it. So, but Jim told me, no, you have to study. I think this would be a great fit for you. You've done turnarounds, It'd be a great fit. So I decided to study. And what did I see? Number one, I saw that uh, the world actually needed Best Buy, right? Because as customers, for some of our purchases, the ability to touch, feel, and experience the products and ask questions is helpful. Think about buying a TV. Picture quality is important. The only place in the world where you can see picture quality is in a store. Or headphones or speakers, the only place in the world where you can test the quality of the sound is in a store. Reviews are important. but uh, So customers needed Best Buy. Vendors needed Best Buy. You know, there was a number of our vendors like Apple and Microsoft and Sony were opening their own stores. This could have been lethal, but the logic, their logic was, no, we need to showcase the fruit of our billions of dollars of R&D investments. But I thought, you know, running stores, in, that's difficult. And building stores into different locations, build the staff. What if Best Buy would become the showcase, the place where they could showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investments? Be good for the customer, be good for the vendors, and be good for us. So the, the world needed Best Buy. The problem was that, uh, you know, the, the, the problems were self-inflicted. You know, our prices were perceived to be too high. Quality of service had gone down. Uh, you know, our, our site was a disaster. Our supply chain was not performing. This was great news because if the problems are self-inflicted, you, know, you can correct this. And I, I thought about a story at the time as it was reflecting because the, the previous management team was, uh, blaming headwinds for their poor performances. They were doing great, except there's some headwinds, like price deflation, things like this. Don't you love leaders who have great excuses? Best excuse, most great. So I thought about calling Jeff Bezos and Tim Cook and said, how's the winds where you're sailing? And I bet you, as we say in Minnesota, I bet you, that uh, they would have said, oh, bear, the wind is just fabulous. We're having the times of our life. Oh, okay, thank you. Wind's not the problem. We must be the problem. That was great news because then if we could fix that, then we could do great things. So that convinced me that there was an opportunity that uh, it'd be fun to uh, to do. And that's the journey we embarked upon. And I, I'm curious, as you thought about the change that was necessary, um, cultural change is in many ways the most difficult change because it, it's, it speaks to how we do things. Uh, and it's not necessarily uh, very comfortable for us to change. As you thought about your vision going forward, which required some cultural change, 
and maybe is reflecting across being a leader in multiple cases. Um, how, to what extent do you bear in mind the the threads of the history of the company, the things that have made it special historically, versus the new things that the organization must do? And and how do you kind of think about bringing people along with the change, the journey that you're anticipating? So, so there was there was really two phases, Peter. So I'll give you two answers. The first phase, which was our turnaround, saving the company. It was actually relatively easy because Best Buy DNA, it's a great company. I mean, it's it been growing. I had known Best Buy when I was in the video games industry. And uh, it was seen as, I mean, I saw them as the best player. And it had a few years where they were not doing well, but the DNA was was good. And so, you know, at the time of the turnaround, I would say that my approach to cultural change, my approach to change management was to change management. <laughs> so change the senior team because that's, you know, I'm a bit of a Maoist fish rot from the head. And so we had to make sure that we had the, when, so here's a leadership lesson. When things are going well, credit the frontliners. If things are not going well, blame, you know, the top of the house. So change management. And then the other thing I would say is the way you change behaviors is by changing behavior. It's not more complicated. What do I mean by this? If we needed to be refocused on, the customers and quality of execution. That's what you do. So how did how did we do some of that? I actually spent, Peter, my first week on the job working in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota. In French, we would say St. Cloud. You and I know this, but over there, it's called St. Cloud. Couldn't have them change their mind. And what I did is that I, I listened to the frontliners, asking them, so what's, bro- what's working well, what's broken? So for example, one of the associates in the store told me, do you know that uh, the search engine on the site is not working? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, type Cinderella, you'll get Nikon cameras. It rhymes, but it's not quite the same. Nobody in headquarters would have mentioned that, right? And so listening and then acting on this, right? Signal to everybody what, that we were going to do is we we're going to not do fancy things. We were going to fix what was broken and then hold ourselves accountable to do this. So sometimes we make it too complicated, but first phase was that. The second phase, once we had saved the company, we started to ask ourselves, what do we want to look like when we grow up? What kind of a company do we want to be? How do we accelerate our growth? And the change there was more significant because it was not just fixing what was broken. It was inventing a future that did not exist yet. So that's when we said, look, we're actually not a consumer electronics retailer. We are a company that's in the business of enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs, right? It's a, it's a mouthful, but it's, a, it's an intent to make a difference in people's lives. Now, if you and I walk in a store and tell the associates in the store, you know what, from now on, we're going to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs, likely reaction from, the, from our wonderful blue shirts is, you're saying, what? <laughs> you want me to do what when I take my shift at 10 a.m.? And so there you need to, there's a lot of work. Because what's interesting, Peter, if we slow down, uh, most companies now know uh, that in order to be successful, they need, to, it's not just about profit, it's about pursuing what I call a noble purpose right, in life, which I think is at the intersection of what the world needs, what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and how you can make money. And so people write down a purpose for their corporation. But if you just do this, nothing happens. And so there's a a set of challenges between that point and when things really change. So you need to make the purpose the cornerstone of your strategy uh, and and, and make it very real. And then you need to make it real for our frontliners. So to your point about changing behavior, how did we do this? Because enriching lives with technology, that doesn't resonate. So we took 40 or 60 of our best middle to senior managers, very credible within the company and and knew the operations really well. And we had them work with a a consultant to help us with this. One of the questions they asked themselves is, what do we look like when we are at our best? Because in a sense, what we were trying to do was be at our best more often. And so to your point, yes, I think it's easier if you can anchor the behavior you're looking to develop into the best of who you are, right? And then, of course, you have to make it real 
for people. So one of the things we did to make it very practical, uh, one uh, Saturday, we closed uh, our stores for a few hours. Uh, and now this was not about showing a glossy PowerPoint presentation or a glossy video. Uh, we went into small groups, and of course I was in one of these trainings, and we shared with each other, so think about you know, three or four, a life story. So I was paired with a young woman. She's, uh, you know, she may be 22. She's been in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She's been homeless. Best Buy is her home or family. So all of a sudden, I see her as a human being, not as an employee. And then the positioning we had chosen for the company was to be an inspiring friend, we said. So think, share with each other who is an inspiring friend in your life. And what does that look like? So for me, it's my older brother, Philip. He's a wonderful guy. And then we say, all right, what we're trying to do is very simple. We're going to try to treat each other as human beings and treat our customers as human beings, not walking wallets. And we're going to try to be inspiring friends for each other and our customers. And so you made it really specific and concrete in a way that I can understand. And then it became easy because then, you know, but... For this to stick, then there's more work that we'll talk about, which is you need to create the environment where people can be themselves and can feel that they can be the best, most beautiful, grandest version of themselves. And that is more work. So this is everything I talk about is easy to understand, really hard to do. Yeah. And uh, it sounds simple, but it's really hard to do. That's why the book, The Heart of Business, is this guide for leaders who are eager to let go of the old ways and embrace, you know, this idea of leading from a place of purpose and with humanity to create great outcomes. Uh, and so a lot of stories, lots of details around that in the book. Very interesting. To talk a bit about what some of the mile markers along the way were, Uber, because as you point out, this is not a light switch. Uh, it's not weeks or months, in fact. A lot of the change you're describing is years of change. And so how did you, um, how did you, what, what metrics were you mining uh, or what interactions were you uh, relying upon to determine whether or not the change you sought was in fact sticking and the results were, were along the lines of what you were anticipating? Yeah, so uh, lots of questions to unpack here. So let's mm -hmm. slow down. So on the question of metrics, one of the issues we had in the store GM uh, in SoundCloud, Noska, told me, Uber. 41 KPIs you guys want me to focus on. How can I do this? It's, it's just impractical because everybody in headquarters wanted their little fiefdom to be, you know, performing in every one of the stores. So this was, so one of the roles we have as leaders is to simplify. We, if, you know, initially boiled it down to two things. We said, and it was almost a joke. We said, we only have two problems. Our revenue is going down and our profit margin is going down. Only two problems. If we had five problems, it might be difficult to solve, you know? uh, but only two problems. So <laughs> we rallied around that. But the truth is, these are financial measures, revenue and, and, and margin. So one of the things I've learned, so that a big principle I talk about, and that was really a key element of the philosophy is you treat profit as an outcome, not the goal. It's like, it's important to, to because it, Imagine your uh, doctor, your MD, treating you with a focus on managing your temperature, right? He says, the only goal is your temperature. I don't like that doctor. I'd like he, him to make sure I'm healthy, you know, because <laughs> maybe he's going to put the thermometer in the fridge, right, or something like this. So we all know, I think, in business that to get to a great outcome, you need to, it starts with people. You need to have the right people with the right tools that are properly, you know, empowered and managed, and you need to have customers uh, you know, who are happy based on the services you, you provide. And it's excellence on what I call the people imperative that leads to excellence on the business imperative, which in turn leads to excellence on the financial imperative. But imperative and goal is not the same. So uh, a lot of indicators on people, we measure it like probably everybody's listening, uh, you know, engagement, turnover, uh, things of that nature, diversity and inclusion. It's so important. So, uh, in particular, you know, if you're able to recruit, you know, uh, uh, do a good job from a gender diversity and ethnic and, and racial diversity when you recruit, do you retain? 
uh, things of so people business so you measure you know net uh, the net promoter score I think is a big deal lifetime value of your customers things of that uh, uh, of that nature and in a sense another trick for everybody listening if you truly believe that it's people first then business then finance when you do your monthly business reviews okay don't start with financial results ends with financial results start with people and organization then customers products business finish with financial results your cfo will make sure you know <laughs> that you spend some time on this but if you flip it if you start with financial results my bet is that you're not going to have much time for you know customers and business and for people and organizations so you have to flip it it's a, it's it's a key enabler at least in my uh, in my experience so that was uh, and the other thought in terms of measurement sometimes we try to make it complicated we spend a lot of time setting goals and and so forth uh, and come back to goals and 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 incentives initially i didn't know how big the potential was uh, you know so it's all about measuring progress is this month better than the previous months and is this month if you have a seasonal business better than the same months last year and then you look at who is moving the fastest and then you look at all right so in chicago we're growing that's the place in the country where we're growing the fastest let's go to chicago let's find out what they're doing you know <laughs> and then uh if it's uh, i don't know des moines iowa where they they're making the subway where it's not going as well let's try to understand and let's see what's going on there and let's send them to Chicago. So it's really this momentum of progress and stimulation. Now, on the point of goals and incentives, let me ask you, Peter, and through you, everybody listening, when you get up in the morning, do you design your day and and you decide how you're gonna behave based on how you may be able to maximize your bonus at the end of the year? No. Not likely. um, why is that that we believe that incentives are so important? And why is it that boards and senior teams spend so much time designing the perfect incentive system? There's research by MIT that shows that financial incentives actually deteriorate performance, right? Because it narrows the mind. And I think one of the things I've learned, Peter, during uh, especially the years leading Best Buy, is that what matters is intrinsic motivation, which is back to the question of why do we work? and understanding what drives you and in connecting what drives you with the purpose of the, of the company. So KPIs, key performance indicators are important, but they're not the solution to everything. We should not overly rely on these metrics and incentives to create the kind of outcome that you'd like to create. Not intuitive, but that's what I've learned. That's fantastic. You mentioned at the outset that um, the fish rots from the head and uh, and actually, I mean, I, I was thinking about a point of contrast. One of the a number of decisions that Circuit City, uh, a former leader in the consumer electronics space, made uh, in in the late, later part of its existence was firing a lot of its most experienced sales staff as a as a means of cutting costs. As you point out, you, you did the exact opposite. You you uh, maintained the sanctity by and large of your your frontline workers and made changes at the top. Talk a bit about the what you looked for in the new leaders uh, and, and ah. what experiences you sought from them uh, in bringing them into the fold to, to enable all you've described. Yes, and, and, and first on the, on the cut, 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 reducing headcount, even in a turnaround, that's the last resort. You know, you first try to grow revenue. And if you're gonna go after cost, simple advice is go after what I call non-salary expenses, which is every element in the cost structure that has nothing to do with people. So an example of this, and then I'll go to your question, is that Best Buy, Peter, do we sell a lot of TVs? Yes, we do. Uh, They are large, they're thin, so they break. Uh, uh, Years ago, we used to break about $200 million worth of TVs every year. (laughs) If you can reduce it by 50%, that's a $100 million saving. You guys are good with calculations. And it's it's good for the customer because exactly 0% of customers want to buy a broken TV and it's good for the PL. <laughs> and so as you look for uh, ways to improve your improve your cost structure, really go for what we call waste and inefficiencies in your core processes. You'll be amazed by the opportunities. And that's something that you establish as a discipline 
year after year after year because you can always get better. To your point about recruiting, uh, I've evolved on that. I used to place a lot of emphasis on uh, expertise and experience. I wanted to recruit the best e-commerce person, the best digital marketing person, you know, the best supply chain person. And skills and experience and expertise are, are, are important. But over time, I've spent more and more time on who is this person? What kind of a leader is this person? What drives them? How do they want to be remembered? I think it was during COVID, we were still in COVID, but last year, I think we, we saw some amazing leadership moments of people truly leading from a place of purpose and with humanity, placing the importance of safety of the employees and the customers first. So what kind of a leader, is that a leader who is pure brain? I think one of the things we've learned uh, in the last few months is that as leaders, we need to lead with all of our body parts, our brain, but also our heart, our soul, our guts, our ears, our hands, our eyes. Um, that's a different discussion. So in my interviews, I ask these questions, what drives you? What's, your, what's going to be your retirement speech? How do you want to be remembered? And one of the things I told the officers at Best Buy when we were spreading out our leadership expectations, I told them, look, if you're, if you're here to serve yourself or serve your boss or me as the CEO of the company, I said, I don't have a problem with that. It's, it's okay. Except you cannot work here. You know, we're going to promote you to customer. And as a customer, we're going to take such good care of you, you know, but you cannot work here. On the other hand, if you're here to serve the frontliners, serve your team, then we're good. So it's these kinds of discussions. I think, in other words, Peter, you know, uh, the role of leaders has changed fundamentally in the last little while. Their mission has changed. It used to be about all, all about profit op optimization, maximum shareholder value creation. It's about now doing good things in the world. The scope has changed. It was all about business. Now you need to deal with the employees, of course, the customers, the vendor partners, you know, the, the community. If the community is on fire, like it's been in Minneapolis, cannot open the stores, right? Cannot run the business. If the planet is on fire, cannot run a business. So the scope has changed and the leadership model has changed. We, we're going from, I think, you know, the model of the superhero. The leader is the superhero who knows everything, who's the smartest person in the room, uh, who's driven by power, fame, glory, and money. Eh, don't want that. We need, I think this, this world needs leaders who are purposeful, who are caring, who know their role is to create an environment where others can be successful, who are vulnerable. You know, the most important phrase for a leader today is, I don't know. Or, my name is Hubert and I need help. That's powerful. That's really interesting. Uh, Best Buy, when you joined and throughout your existence was also a public company. And so you had Wall Street to deal with, uh, which has at times uh, has an influence that works against some of what you've described, short termism, uh, the quarter by quarter earnings and so on. I know that that was not necessarily your, your primary area of focus. Everything you've said so far speaks to the long term nature uh, in which you, were, you and the team were planning. But talk a bit about your relationship with Wall Street and how you can counsel them that look, you know, what the change we are, we seek is many quarters out, not just this, this quarter to come. Important to talk about this. One of the things I've learned from a client when I was at McKinsey years ago was he said, Hubert, 98% of the questions that are asked as either or are better answered as ends. So should we take care of the short term or the long term? The customers or the shareholders? The company or the planet? It's ends. We have to embrace the power of ends and refuse the tyranny of or. And so our shareholders you know, and we had we developed a great relationship with them. Now, when I started, our credibility was zero, right? Everybody thought we were going to die. And so words were not of great importance at the time. <laughs> you know, so we, we started to focus on our say-do ratio, the ratio between what we were going to do compared to what we said we were going to do. And we wanted to be as close to one as possible to rebuild credibility. The choice is not between long term and short term. You have to embrace both, uh, Peter. It's like, a, you know, at a personal level, let's say I want to lose 10 pounds. You think I'm credible if before I lose 10 pounds, I gain 20? 
you know, let's get going. <laughs> and so in our relationship with the shareholders, we we're very clear with them about what we thought the situation was. You know, my name is Hubert and I need to lose 10 pounds. <laughs> we told them, this is where we believe the opportunity is and, and they're very concrete and they're within our control. This is what we're going to do about these opportunities. And then later on, this is, this is what we've started to do. This is what we're seeing. And then this is the next steps that we're uh, planning ahead of us. Um, life is not linear. So sometimes, you know, there was, uh, I think after four or five uh, quarters of leading the, the company, we missed one quarter. So we told them, oh, we made a few mistakes. And you ask, you know, why do we fall, Bruce? Like in the Batman movie. Well, so that we can learn. <laughs> We can learn to pick ourselves up. And then you say, okay, so let's go back on the saddle. The shareholders, they're not evil. They're not the problem. Any leader who says, we cannot perform, it's because of the shareholders. Again, somebody looking for an excuse. No, no, no. You respect them. They're very important. Because Why, why are they important? Well, people like you and I give, us, give them our money to take care of our retirement. So we want to do a good job for them. We respect them. We're, trans we're uh, uh, humble. We... Uh, uh, we, we, we try to uh, build a trust-based relationship. Um, and this is an ongoing relationship. So I believe that in a, in a sense, I have this vision of business. Uh, you know, you pursue a North Star, which is your noble purpose. You put people at the center because they're the, the source, they're the engine. You build relationships with all of your stakeholders and you try to optimize performance by embracing all of the stakeholders in pursuit of that purpose, in a way that's uh, that's congruent. Um, I was transparent with our shareholders. At some point in our journey, I told an investor meeting, I said, uh, our purpose as a company is not to make money. It's an imperative. And by the way, you know, during my time, I think when I studied, the share price went down to about $11, and I think we're now at 120 So we did okay for the shareholders, but it made a distinction between an imperative, something that's important, in, the, in, in, in the, the ultimate purpose. And we explain why purpose was so important for our employees. And, and uh, because why is that? Let's imagine, Peter, the, the day I walk in at Best Buy, I tell everyone in the company it's going to be very exciting. Our main mission is going to be to double the share price. You know, it would have been, who is this mom? I mean, who is this guy, right? Uh, it, it really does not understand. Does he think, by the way, we have, you know, that all of us have shares and options, you know, is like uh, not real. Uh, and so it's a bit the same question as, you know, the eulogy question. How do we want to be remembered? What, mm -hmm. what difference do we want to make in the world? So shareholders are not the enemy. They're a very important stakeholder. We work for them as well as the other uh, stakeholders, and we try to make it congruent. That's the, that's, I think, the opportunity we have ahead of us. That's fantastic. You've talked about this noble purpose and and at Best Buy, the purpose has been enriching people's lives through technology. I'm paraphrasing. And you alluded earlier in our conversation that you wanted to be a mechanism for technology companies to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars invested in technology, in research and development. Talk a bit about making that a reality. That was a, a, obviously a, a new uh, strategy for the organization and it involved creation of new partnerships. It was some part it's offense and some parts defense, as you pointed out, so that the Microsofts and Sonys had a place to showcase those without necessarily yeah. having to seek to create their own stores and so on. T talk a bit about the, the, that evolution, please. Yeah, this was so so fascinating. Uh, again, something we need to refuse is zero-sum games. Zero-sum game. The only way for you, Peter, to win is if I lose or vice versa. That's stupid. Who said that? And so I think as leaders, we have to and I think in the tech industry, we, we understand this, right? There's so many great partnerships. It's rare that you can do something on your own. And in our case, uh, it was clear, as I mentioned, that uh, you know these vendors needed a place where to showcase uh, the fruit of their billions of dollars of, of R&D investment. So in December of 2012, so during the very dark days, <laughs> uh, J.K. Shin, the CEO of Samsung Electronics, came to visit us in Minneapolis. And uh, Samsung, of course, competing with Apple and a bunch of other companies, uh, Sony, LG, uh, they could have decided to open their own stores. And in some countries around the world, they actually have their own stores. 
But it would have taken months and months and months, if not years, to find the locations, have them built, been built out, staff them, learn how to run stores. I mean, it's it's a, it's not easy, you know. Anybody who believes that running one thousand stores is easy, you know, you're, you're mistaken. And so instead, we said there's a an opportunity. Uh, you could have what we called a Samsung store within a store at Best Buy within the Best Buy store. Great locations, that's a great, great traffic of people interested in technology. You're going to be across the aisle from Apple or Microsoft or Sony. And you're going to be able to build out a true, we call it Samsung experience. Over dinner, we did this deal. And in a matter of months, Samsung got uh, you know 1,000 stores uh, within our Best Buy stores, uh, good for the customer. They could see it, you know, compare and touch. Also good for the customer because there's not a single home, Peter, in America or in the world that's monobrand. Even I've not visited his house, but I'm going to bet that Steve Jobs' house was not just Apple products, right? Because they don't do TVs, they don't do refrigerators uh, and, and so forth. So you need to uh, bring things to, together. So good for the customer, good for the vendor and good for us because, of course, we made some money out of this. The ultimate one was around Amazon. A number of retailers you know, were really afraid of Amazon and were refusing to carry their products because they saw Amazon as a threat. We said, no, our customers, they love the Amazon products, you know, Kindle first and then the Echo products and so forth. That's our business. So we're going to, of course, sell, sell Amazon's product and make money doing this. And then ultimately in 2018, uh, our teams made a deal where uh, Amazon gave Best Buy the exclusive rights to the Fire TV platform to be embedded in smart TVs. And they would only be sold at Best Buy or by Best Buy on Amazon.com. And when we announced the deal, so Jeff came, came to one of our stores and he said, look, a, a TV is a considerate purchase. Uh, you need a, uh, you know, you, you need to see them. And Best Buy is the best place in the world where you can do this. And he also said, look, we've developed this relationship for the last 10 years. It's a trust-based relationship. We both feel that we can do this. So again, refuse zero-sum games and uh, try to develop win-win uh, win-win partnerships. Another great story that you've told is uh, in, in addressing human needs with technology, there are new ways, uh, new okay. opportunities that can be pursued. You, you talked about this one with the health of seniors. And I wonder yeah. if you could tell that story uh, again in this forum as well. Yeah, because this is, this, is this was a transformative piece. So when we were starting to think about what kind of company do we want to look like? So I actually said, we're actually not a consumer electronics retailer. If you define your business in such terms, you, you, you narrow, you limit your scope. You know, think about Mayo Clinic. You know, if Mayo Clinic define themselves as a hospital system, a brick and mortar hospital system, they can only serve patients who come to them in Rochester, Minnesota, or in Arizona, and maybe in Florida. If they think of themselves as a company that's focused on the health and wellness of the population, they can treat patients and people around the world. So it expands your markets. And so same is true for Best Buy. So one of the things we did is focused on, so there's a trend, right, in, in, in the world, which is population is aging. And there's a big problem for all, uh, those of us who have aging parents. You know, the, the, it's good for people, for aging seniors to be able to stay in their home longer and live there independently, be it, you know, a hospice or a hospital, frankly. But of course, you know, sometimes they live alone. And so as children, we're worried about them. So the service we have, is one where we place sensors under their bed, under their sofa, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, fall detection. And with remote monitoring and artificial intelligence, we can detect if something bad is happening or about to happen. And then we have care centers who can trigger an intervention. So it really meets you know, a, a need, a human need. Uh, with an acquisition we made, we made and with the Geek Squad and our relationship with tech companies, we have the capabilities to do this. Who wouldn't? Who would not be passionate about helping, you know, your parents? And then, of course, uh, we could make money out of this. Interestingly enough, Peter, this is not sold through the Best Buy stores; it's sold through insurance companies. So it shows that if you can define your business in terms of purpose, 
it expands the addressable market and accelerates your, your growth. The other example is the in-home advisor program, where if your need is too complex to be really handled on the site or in a store, like you're redoing your entire family room or your kitchen or your patio, it's hard to figure out, right? So we'll have a professional come to your place have the conversation there, look at what you have, look at what you're trying to accomplish. This is a free visit. We'll develop a proposal. You can always say no. And if this works out, this the idea is for us to become, or this person to become like the CIO or CTO for your home. And we all know that our homes are becoming more and more complex. And so if you were a retailer, you would not think about this. But if you were here to enrich lives and develop relationships, Uh, And the business opportunity is extraordinary because it's a real need. And then, of course, if we're good, we can expand what we call our share of wallet, meaning the share of the technology purchases that our customers uh, make with us. So it's a delightful offer. This is a free infomercial. I encourage everybody to ask for this uh, service if if your need is is complex and you need somebody to come to your your home to help you design the right solution. Good advice. Uh, you also talk about the need for "quote unquote" human magic uh, for outcome, outcomes that defy logic, uh, and you a couple of things that you highlight. One of which you've alluded to briefly earlier was uh, the importance for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, but you also talk about the need for reverse mentorship uh, and the role that that's played for you personally and for your executive team, more yeah. generally speaking. Talk a bit about some of this human magic that you uh, you, you believe needs to be uh, brought up through the organization. Yeah, because it's another place where, you know, with certainly what I learned when I was at business school in my early years as an executive or as a leader is either wrong, incomplete, or, or dated. The, the, the old notion of, you know, for things to get done in a company, you know, you take a bunch of smart people, you create a smart strategy, a smart plan, you communicate it, you put metrics in place, maybe incentives in place, and you hope for a good outcome. Eh, It doesn't work because motivation is intrinsic. So you are, this is a key point. So let's slow down. Our main role as leader is to create an environment where this human magic can happen. Let me illustrate what I mean by human magic. So here's a story. And I, I've told you that in 2012, when I started, quality of service at Best Buy you know, had gone down and was not great. So fast forward to 2018 or 2019, there's a, a young mother who comes to one of our stores with a young child, a young boy, three or four years old. For her day, little Charlie had gotten a, a dinosaur toy. Unfortunately, uh, the dinosaur toy is a bit sick. The head has been dismantled. So the dinosaur is not in good shape. So they go to Best Buy where they bought the, the toy. And the, the mother explains to the uh, associate what's, what's going on. Now, at, you know, in the old days or at most stores, you would be sent to the toy aisle and with luck, you would be able to find a replacement. This is not what happened. There's two blue shirt associates who understood what was happening. They took the sick dinosaur, they went behind the counter started performing a surgical procedure on the sick dinosaur, walking the child through the steps. Like, you know, if you watch Good Doctor on Amazon, they take you through a step. And of course, at the last minute, substituted the the, the, the dinosaur and gave back to the child a cured dinosaur. Imagine for a second, the joy of the child and the mother. And now ask yourself, Peter, was there a standard operating procedure at Best Buy on how to deal with sick dinosaur or maybe a memo from me the very smart CEO on how to deal with, of course not. These two associates found it in their hearts to create this magic, to create this happiness. And they found it in their heart. And also they felt that they had the latitude to do this. I saw that when our sales were accelerating and I understood at that time, which was happening at the company at scale, 125,000 people or so, People were felt that they could do these kinds of things. So the question is, how do you make this happen? Because if you can, oh my God, that's extraordinary for the employees, the customers, the shelters, everybody, right? So the first thing is to, back to this, why do we work? Is help everybody at the company connect what drives them with the purpose of the company. We talked about this. The second one is, to, is, is your point about building authentic human connections. And so let me give you another example here. There's a 
a young associate uh, who once told me his life at Best Buy changed the day a manager recognized him and took an interest in him. And he felt, you know, I, I am seen, I am respected, I exist. And, you know, I can grow, I can blossom at the, at the company. Uh, that means, uh, you know, it's the role of leadership and it's the role of a vulnerable leader. So Cami, our head of HR, one day revealed to the entire company that for years she had struggled with depression following the deaths of her two parents. You know, who, which C-suite executive of a Fortune 100 company talks about this? Not many people. And yet it conveyed the idea that oh, we're all human and that we can be vulnerable. And so she got hundreds of email thanking her for this. It's about you know, your point about diversity and inclusion. So diversity and inclusion for me starts with each individual, like the young man who felt that you know, he was recognized, that he existed. But then you also have to look at systemic issues around gender, race, uh, and ethnicity. Uh, I think following the, the horrible murder of George Floyd in, in my hometown of, uh, of Minneapolis, I think the level of awareness around systemic racism in this country has, has gone up. It's a business issue. It's a moral issue. It's a human issue. It is a business issue. Uh, how can you run a company if your leadership team, your workforce does not represent, is not representative of the customers and the community you're trying to serve? You're going to miss Take a very simple example. If you're in Chicago, a certain part of Chicago, if your if your blue shirts don't speak Polish, good luck selling anything. You know, <laughs> and the country is becoming brown. Uh, so of course uh, we we and, and there's so many illustrations of this. But also, if the community is on fire, like it has been in Minneapolis, you cannot run a business. So you need to seize this as a business priority. It's embarrassing that you know, this issue of diversity and inclusion has been on the, on the table for many, many years with no great outcome. But I believe today, I'm actually optimistic because I feel that using their brain, but also their heart, leaders know that this needs to be fixed. And in the corporate world, can we agree that if we determine that something is important, is a priority, we know how to get things done. I mean, our betting average is not bad. And so this is a priority. And so let's uh, do the work. Let's understand why we're not recruiting, why not we're not retaining. Let's understand what needs to change. Let's understand how we can we we can use our, our power to make things happen. And let's get on with it. Let's hold ourselves accountable. Boards are now holding a management team uh, accountable. And large companies have a huge role to play. I love the general counsel at Coca, the Coca Cola company has told all of the law firms they're using within the next eight, that was in January this year. Send a memo. Within the next 18 months, I'm going to select a team of legal advisors and they're going to need to be diverse. And then there's going to be milestone. And anyone missing the milestones moving towards greater diversity, in particular from a black diversity standpoint, I'm going to reduce their fees by 30% every quarter. You have a choice. You don't need, you don't need to work for us. It's okay. We'll find somebody else. So this needs, to, this needs to happen. And for me, that's part of the human magic. If, why would we focus on recruiting from only a quarter of the population and expect that it's going to create a good outcome? It's not. Great points all. I mentioned at the outset, Hubert, uh, the portfolio of items you're now involved with, board work, uh, book writing, clearly, uh, teaching at Harvard Business School. Uh, I wonder if you can reflect on this phase of your journey. And are, are you? Is there any chance you would become a CEO of a company again, or is that is that now firmly in your past? Yeah, when I, um, I'm very proud of the the way uh, I passed the baton of CEO and then chairman at Best Buy, a CEO to the wonderful Corey Barry, who's uh, one of the most amazing uh, uh, leaders I've ever uh, seen. Uh, and when I made that decision. I made uh, a few other decisions. First, I was not moving down south to Florida to play golf with aging white men because I don't play golf, right? So what would be the point? <laughs> Two, I was not going to be a CEO anymore. You know, been there, done that uh, altogether for more than 15 years. Uh, three, I wanted my next chapter to matter. And so I reflected, you know, what do I want to do over the next, you know, pick a number, 10, 15, 20, 25 years? Because I'm young, right? I'm 61, I'll turn 62 this summer. 
And I felt that what I wanted to do, my passion, my purpose, was to add my voice and my energy to what I think is this urgent and necessary refoundation of business and capitalism around purpose and, and humanity. And I felt I had learned a lot over the last 30 years. And the fact that, you know, the, the Best Buy turnaround is such a delightful, you know, surprisingly delightful, <laughs> you know, uh, story that gives me credibility. Because a lot of what I talk about can sound soft, even though it's really hard to do. But I'm not somebody who's been smoking something that may be illegal. This is actually what created this extraordinary outcome. And so I'm not the only voice in that space, but I think with others using the platform I have, I, I think I can make a, a difference. And so, yes, writing the book, talking about the book, teaching the board work, and also I'm, I'm uh, uh, mentoring and coaching CEOs and senior executives who are on this journey, right? We're all on this journey. How can we get better and how can we create this future that does not exist yet, but that absolutely needs to be better than what we have today? Uber, I, I hope you don't mind my asking. Um, one of the uh, my own hypothesis, not mine alone, certainly, uh, is that really one of the secret sauce uh, aspects of the of the U.S. is immigration and our being welcoming of of those from other countries. As people recognize, uh, your your accent is not a is not a Minnesota accent. Uh, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> oh darn! I've been yeah. working on this. So intense. Despite despite your Vikings and baseball references, you know oh. uh, th those aside. Oh, and I, I wonder if you can reflect on um, reflect on that from the perspective of an immigrant, that uh, somebody who came to this country uh, many years ago has succeeded uh, and, and risen to the, the top top posts in very important organizations in this country, um, a reflection upon the importance of that uh, from your perspective. Yeah, this I mean, we are a country of immigrants, right? I mean, it's 100 percent. Um and, you know, when you look at the largest, most successful companies in the country, I forgot the exact number, but it's some extraordinary number uh, that have been founded by either immigrants or children of immigrants. And of course, there's many of them who are led uh, by immigrants. And I think part of the strengths of this country, it's, uh, it's the vague a magnet for, for talent. Now, sometimes when the environment is tough, it can be tempting to again see the world as zero-sum games, right? And say, you know, let's close the borders because that way, you know, we'll have more opportunity. And I'm not saying that, you know, we should have 8 billion people living in the U.S. These are complex uh, questions, the question of, uh, you know, refugees and so forth. These are difficult, and I'm not listening, an expert at this, but the general idea is to embrace, you know, I call this the art of possibilities, right? Think about what's possible and embrace talent and, and, and have confidence in the ability of uh, great human beings, you know, creating a better, a better outcome. We're going to need, if we want to avoid, you know, a, an environmental catastrophe, we're going to need the best talent and ingenuity. And I think this country has the ability to create an environment where a great time can happen. So, you know, the, we go back and forth and I think Congress has demonstrated its complete inability to pass any kind of good law on, on systematic uh, comprehensive immigration reform because the two sides, you know, uh, want some of the same thing, but they also want different things and they decide not to agree. So that's really sad because I think that uh, there's much more. I think let's take, uh, so I, I teach at, uh, at HBS. I think we have all of these students. Higher education is one of the great capabilities of this country. So we attract, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, students from around the world. I think it may be tempted to staple a green card to their diploma and say, if you want, you know, you're welcome to stay. If you want to go back to uh, to France, it's, it's okay, right? They, they do have... They also have good wines and cheese in France, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you'd like to stay, we'd love to uh, to welcome you. That would be a simple, uh, you know, decision, uh, but it's sometimes <laughs> more complicated than it, than it needs to be. Indeed. 
Well, Hubert Jolie, thank you so much for a terrific conversation, reflecting the lessons of a remarkable career. For those who wish to go deeper, again, I will remind them, uh, you've got it over your right shoulder. I'll put it in front of my face. Uh, the Heart of Business, certainly a recommended read. Uh, thank you so much for taking time with me today. It's been a great pleasure. Peter, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Everyone, let's all decide. It's our decision, right? We get to decide what kind of a leader we want to be. And I think the world needs us to be the best, biggest, most beautiful version uh, of ourselves. And I hope the book is helpful to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you can reach me. You can communicate with me at hubertjolie.org. Uh, so it's my first name, my last name, uh, .org. There's more content there. And I look forward to uh, really amplifying this movement. That's a movement that's underway, Peter. And so we need that movement to, to expand. We need more like this. Mm -hmm. So thank you. No, thank you so much for the great work that you're doing.